Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Do we have, yeah, I see some gentlemen as well here. Welcome, welcome to all. Uh, my name is uh, Sara Hurland and I'm the managing director of Intelligence Squared. And we are thrilled to see that so many of you have been able to join us tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, just very briefly, for those of you who um, are not familiar with Intelligence Squared, we host uh, talks and debates here in London and around the world. Tonight, we have a distinguished panel uh, with us here to talk about the politics of black hair. Uh, and to guide us through the discussion, we have Hannah Poole. Hannah is a distinguished author, journalist, and curator. Uh, and I would be so pleased if you would join me in giving Hannah a warm welcome. Hannah Poole. Thank you very much, um, Sarah. And thank you, everybody, for coming out here uh, tonight. Uh, I think the biggest problem we're going to have with this discussion is that we've only got an hour. Um, <laughs> so we're going to get going quite quickly. But I just want to say at the beginning that this is going to be, we're going to hear from the panelists, but a lot of this is going to be a proper conversation. I'm really keen to get everybody's views and opinions and to get lots of audience interaction. So there will be plenty of time for that once the speakers have spoken. So, our first speaker is Diane Abbott, uh, the Labour MP for Hackney North and Stoke Newington. In 1987, Diane became the first black woman ever elected to British, to British Parliament. She has since then built a distinguished career as a parliamentarian, broadcaster and commentator. Please welcome Diane Abbott. <laughs> Diane, bearing in mind we only have an hour. <laughs> <laughs> How many different styles have you worn your hair in? Oh, I was trying to count before we came on the set and I couldn't. But first let me say, when I got the invite to this, I was so excited. I said, I must do this because I think black women in their hair is such an important and actually intensely political subject. I could be doing other things, but I really wanted to do this. My hair, um, I've got masses of very, very frizzy hair. Um, and... I think someone was saying just before that having your hair combed is a really relaxing spiritual experience. Not if you've got masses of very frizzy hair. As a child, my, my, my mother had to comb up my hair. She used to wash it every week, comb it out every week, and it really hurt to comb it out. But what have I had? I had lovely plaits when I was a primary school age with ribbons, fresh ribbons every day. In some ways, that was my best look. I had an <laughs> afro. I had an afro when I got to Cambridge. I cut my hair and had an afro, and all my family said, as West Indian's families will do, what have you done to your good <laughs> hair? Um, then I had braids. When I was first at an MP, I had these wonderful braids, about the length of that lady there, down to my shoulders, but very fine. Then I had, I had braids with bits of gold threading. I had other braids. I had cane rows. I've had wigs, not very often I had wigs. I hadn't had a wig. The first time I had a wig... I was a student and was a Saturday girl at Selfridges and I was working next to the wig counter so I bought this wig and then I'd been wearing it for a few weeks and I was on the tube and the door closed on my <laughs> wig <laughs> and then I moved my head forward and my wig came off not worn a wig for about 30 years um, but I have done wigs I've done with some of the old ones when remember the wet look white people say wet look what was that it's a particular type of curly perm which you had to keep greasy all day long it was horrible really <laughs> Think of the early Michael Jackson. Um, I've had relaxed, had my own hair chemically straightened. I've had my own hair chemically straightened and short, chemically straightened and long. And I've had weave. Sometimes just one track weave, like we're not talking about. Sometimes my whole head in a weave. And you know, true confessions, my whole head is in a weave tonight. But sadly, I didn't get to go to the hairdresser before I came. <laughs> I think I stopped counting at around 20. Yeah, <laughs> okay, brilliant. So there's lots of stuff to jump off on there. But um, I'm going to move over next to Emma. Um, Emma Dabiri is a writer and commentator. She's a PhD researcher at the sociology department in, at Goldsmiths University. Three years ago, she quit the whole relaxing jive and stopped straightening her hair. Please welcome Emma. So, Emma, um, I know that you've worn your hair in lums, a number of different styles. Can you tell us a bit about why you wear your hair the way you do today? Yeah, happily. Um, but um, in order to kind of contextualise my personal choices, I just have to kind of put that in a broader picture of the things that have influenced those choices. Um, so I want to be clear as well that I'm not castigating anyone else's choices, but I just want to interrogate the landscape that informs the choices that we make. So I always say that my hair has been... This is really loud. I always say my hair has been disappointing people for over 30 years. Um, I think being mixed race or light skin, the expectation is that you will have good hair. Um, I'm sure that most of you 
are aware of this, but I'm thinking maybe some aren't. Um, there's a hierarchy of hair um, where sometimes certain types of hair are perceived as, as, as better, more attractive than others. So the more tightly coiled Afro hair is not seen as being, sometimes not perceived as being attract, as attractive as more loosely curled, softer, kind of typical mixed race hair. And so even though I'm mixed race, I got the more Nigerian hair. So I feel like <laughs> I, let, I was letting people down. Growing up, my hair was always framed as a problem that needed to be managed. Um, so anything that could be done to disguise it or mutilate it, or mutilate, mutilate it was, was, um, was, was fair game. Um, I've had the wet look perm, which I probably gives my age away. Um, <laughs> I've had chemical straighteners. All ty I've done all types of horrific things to my hair. And my hair was just for so many years damaged, misunderstood, broken, and unloved. Um, growing up, I really struggled with feelings of self-worth. Um, being a, a, a black child in a white environment in Ireland um, was quite difficult. And I really came up lacking um, according to the dominant beauty standard um, in Ireland, which is kind of imagined as... Um, Femininity and beauty there can only be um, perceived as existing through kind of long, flowing hair, and I really didn't fit the bill. Um, so growing up, my hair texture seemed more of an issue than my skin colour. Um, so I'm always really interested in this idea that it's just hair, because we'd never really say it's just skin colour. Um, skin colour has been recognised as being the site of racialised difference, but for people of African descent, I think our hair racialises us as much often as much as our complexion. Um, so like most girls, I was taught that being beautiful was really important, but um, I couldn't really fit into that beautiful picture. Um, beauty meant having European or Asian-looking hair. Um, so I'd been, I'd been conditioned to find that beautiful and to find my own hair ugly. Um, just quickly, I always find it interesting um, the way we police our language around race and racism. Um, contemporary racists are terrified of being seen to use racist terminology, lest they be accused of being racist. Um, but hair remains the site where racist language is still used unhesitatingly, in my opinion. And this is no surprise when we look at... Um, kind of TV and media images. Um, while black women are now permitted on TV in small numbers, our hair is not. Um, the message is black women are okay, but our hair isn't. We're only acceptable, I think, if we look like white women with darker skins. And it's actually now more permissible to actually have a dark-skinned woman on TV than it is to show Afro hair. Afro hair is still denied visibility. And black women are, will only be featured wearing natural hair if their hair is curly and bouncy, um, features that correspond with the European scopic regime of beauty. Um, I have loads of examples as well if you want to talk about that later. But then I think it's hardly surprising. When we look at the adjectives that are used to describe every other group's hair, they're largely complementary. You've got gl glossy, shiny, luscious, thick, long. And then compare that with the words used to describe our hair. They're all pejorative. Coarse, dry, tough, short, nappy, frizzy, wild. Like, it's just, it's, it's outrageous. Anyway, I think that we desperately need a new vocabulary that accommodates the beauty of Afro hair. We need to stop judging it by the standards used to evaluate European and Asian hair, silky, soft, flowing, blah, blah, blah. These words construct beauty in a way that's not designed to include us, um, so I think we should just allow it, basically. Judged by these standards, which I want to remind you are not universal, merely the product of a very particular culture, albeit one that's been exported usually by force all over the world, how can our hair not come up lacking? And now I'll just finish by answering why I wear my hair the way that I do. So the issue of our hair doesn't exist in isolation. We can't say that it's just hair. Um, it's part of a wider set of processes whereby everything that's African is seen as being inferior to, to European. It's part of the same legacy whereby African parents often won't teach their children African languages, the emphasis being on speaking a European language well. Everything European is seen as being superior. So this is from the systems of governance and mod models of development which African countries must follow and which largely don't work. They all follow European templates. There's a complete disregard for the complex civiliz civilizations that existed before, let's call it the European encounter. 
So just to finish, I decided not to play along with this game anymore, the rules of which I think have been fixed for me to lose. One of the most simple and demonstrative ways that I can empower myself for this work is by choosing not only to wear, but to love and embrace the hair that I've been conditioned to hate. Drawing inspiration from other black feminists, um, such as Audre Lorde, the personal is, and always will remain, for me, political. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emma. Our next speaker is Edie Bow, um, award-winning hair and makeup artist and founder of London-based studio Edie Bow. Uh, Edie, tonight you're rocking a long weave. Can you tell us, have you always gone for this style? Hi, everyone. Okay, so I'm a bit different, as you can tell. You know, the blonde hair and the makeup. I love beauty. I love all kinds of beauty. Right now, I'm really jealous of Emma's hair right now. Like, I wish I had that, but I don't have that. I've had everything. As a hairstylist, I started doing hair from when I was like... I think 10 in secondary school. So I love hair, I love braids, natural hair, relaxed hair, everything, I love hair. I'm just really, honestly, lazy. Literally, right now I'm wearing a wig. Because guess what, I wake up in the morning, I put it on, and I'm good to go. Literally, <laughs> running a company is really hard. Like I literally can't be doing a lot to my hair every time. So honest, honest truth is that I like the convenience of having this hair. If I have a wig like that as well, actually, I have a variety of wigs. But obviously, I choose to have this look for today. Last year, I was in red hair for a whole year. And this year, hopefully, I'll be in blonde hair for the whole year for this year. But literally, I've done all everything. I've done, you know, afro, small, big. I love big hair, though. Like, I love bigger hair than that. So to answer Sorry. questions, like, literally, I, like, that's my sister over there with the big hair. And that's our style. <laughs> we love big hair here. And that's literally very natural looking. So I'm not about not looking like a black woman. I'm about looking like an amazing person of myself. And I feel like I look good today. I mean, do you think so, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> So that's my theory today. So my hairstyles, if you had to go into it, I, when I was in secondary school, I did like literally a different style every week. I had red, purple, pink, short. Sh I actually had one side last year. Yeah, I had one safe side, so I've done everything. So yeah, that's me for today. So Edie, do you get frustrated when um, there are constant conversations about the politics of black hair? Oh, no, 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 I don't get frustrated about that. I get frustrated when a natural hair person says, why do you have a weave? That's when I get frustrated. Because once again, I do not judge anybody for whatever hair they choose to have. I love hair. So if you have natural hair and you're looking good, yes. But don't think that you're actually better than me for not having natural hair. I'm not a sellout. I literally just literally very lazy. That's so do you think is. that natural haired black women are judgy? Not all of them. For me personally, because what I do, I meet a lot of people that I love weaves. So I don't get to meet them a lot. But every so often I've heard, I've seen comments and blogs. But personally, I've never met one before, no. No. Diane, what do you feel about the fact we're still discussing black women and our hair? Like I said, I think it's an intensely political subject. And I'm kind of conflicted on it, because I've had weaves, and I've had false hair, and I've had this, and I have that. But ultimately, I do think your hair is a kind of political and cultural signifier. I do. Um, and ultimately, I think the less your hair looks like the kind of hair an actual black woman would have, the more likely I am to sort of wonder about your whole world's outlook, which is probably very unfair, but I, that's kind of where I am. And, it, you know, when I was young, the heroine of the hour was Angela Davis with that huge afro. So for me, you know, natural hair absolutely is a political signifier. But as a woman who's, who's run through everything from wet looks to weaves to wigs, you know, I can't put my hand up and say I'm guiltless. But I think what it probably is that my love of variety has overcome my sort of political views about natural hair. But just to say, I don't think a wig is the easiest thing. The easiest thing is the hairstyle I had in my 20s, which is a short afro. You go under the shower in the morning, you take an afro pit, boom, you're good to go. And I suspect that will be the, the hairstyle I revert to. But just to say something about hair, my son... He's always had his hair very short because I'm a single mother. I can't be doing with combing hair in the morning, right? And I used to say to him, you know, President Barack Obama, Jay-Z, if short hair is good enough for them, it's good enough for you. But then <laughs> when he... That's what I used to say, right? Any excuse not to have to comb his hair. But um, when he was graduate, when he was last year at uni, he decided he wanted an afro. So he grew this kind of slightly matted afro. And then my, one of my friends said to him, you know, if you wanted to look longer, you need to have to plait it up at night. 
Now, I hadn't told him that because I knew who would be doing the cutting. <laughs> but once she had revealed this secret, I did indeed cut it up one night. And then he woke up in the morning, I picked it out for him, and he goes, oh, my God, it's so long. Oh, is it going to be like this forever? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I said, just put your head under a shower, James, and your hair will go back. <laughs> and I had to give him an Afro pick, buy the original kind of 80s Afro spray. And what struck me is a lot of young people nowadays do not know how to look after Afro hair. So at what age was that? So when oh, he first so learned what his hair was like, texturally, because he'd been wearing it short for so long, how old was he? About 20. Right. It was his last year at uni. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Edie, I'm going to ask a question that I should never ask, but I'm going to ask it. <laughs> how much did your weave cost? <laughs> oh, I don't mind. I sell it, so I don't mind selling it. Okay, all right. Um, <laughs> how much is a high-quality weave? I have three units. This is the third one. I have one that's 1,600. I think this <gasps> one is... That's pounds, by the way. Not dollars or anything. That's pounds. <laughs> I mean, um, this one, I think, is 800 I think. But bear in mind, blonde hair is more expensive. But if you love it, like, you buy it, <laughs> you love it, to be honest. What was that, sorry? It was a giggle at the fact that blonde hair was more expensive. Did you and think? then, no, no, it requires more process. It's not because it's more right. better looking, literally. And it is, it, is your hair, is it human hair, or is of it course, synthetic? Yeah. You know, you say, of course... Do you think there are any ethical, ethical issues with human hair? Weeks? I personally don't. I sell it, so I don't. Mm -hmm. If I did, I wouldn't be selling it. The rest of the panel? I mean, it's, it, it's a quite a broad question because it depends where the hair is sourced from. But Do you think that you can ever find ethically sourced human hair? From what I've heard, yes, no. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. I'm, but I'm not the expert. The stories that I've heard is not ethically sourced. It's incredibly exploitative. But that's just what I've heard, and I'm, I'm not an expert on that. But. Diane, if you had um, a young political hopeful... Uh, and she came to you and said, you know, I really want to get elected, I want to get into politics. Uh, would you recommend she had long straight hair or an afro? Do you know, someone came to see me just this week to talk about her career, I'm her mentor. And I just did the thing about hair, you know, because she, uh, she wants to go into politics, but her first step is to go and work in a, a big corporate law firm. And I said, the thing about hair is, in a corporate environment, she should look neat. What her, her basic hairstyle is, she has long braids. And I said, that's fine, because that, that's neat, it's smart, you can tie it back if you want to. I, I don't think now that having braids or having an afro is, you know, is a problem in a corporate or a political environment. However, there was a time, I remember going to Jamaica in the 70s, as a teenager, and wearing my afro, and people telling me, well, you couldn't work in a bank in Jamaica with an afro. You couldn't do a lot of corporate jobs in Jamaica at that time with an afro. Um, when I became an MP and I had all these long braids, people thought that was mildly shocking. Mm -hmm. and, in the, and I went, well, they did. I love that that's the thing they thought that was shocking about you. Yeah, that was the most, <laughs> most shocking thing. And in America, you definitely, in the 80s, could not wear braids or a very Afro mm -hmm. hairstyle in a corporate environment. And just to say, if you look at Michelle Obama, I think Michelle would look fabulous in an Afro, but I think Michelle has made a judgment that straightened hair for the great American public is, is where it's It's at. one step too far. One step mm -hmm. too far. Although what I respect about her, she doesn't chemically straighten her children's hair. Black people will understand what she, what she does. When you see them in the long straight hair, it's clearly been pressed. But for most of the time, she has, there hasn't been knots. And, and I think it's nice that she's kept her children's hair basically natural. Do you think you will, we will ever see a, uh, a black prime minister in this country in your lifetime with an afro? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember Mrs. Thatcher. Well, perhaps not myself. Maybe a black man, but there you go. But a um, black man, and then would he be able to also have an afro? Oh, sure, sure. I mean, the, the life is moving on so quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Um, okay, I think that's a good time at which to open things out to the audience. We've got two roving mics. So um, if you could wait until the mic gets to you, even if you think you've got a very loud voice, uh, this is being filmed. So if you could wait till the mic reaches you. Um, and, yeah, just put your hands up. Great. And um, I just wanted to clarify the point because you said you're not an expert. What we found is we've um, gone to Cambodia, and um, Cambodia is probably the best example. And we have now found that there's a whole kind of subculture industry of women who had previously worked in quite dangerous trades like the sex trade. And the growth and kind of burgeon of human hair has given them an alternative. So we have donors who will grow their hair. They come along, they get their hair cut, you know, very short. It's not kind of scalped or anything, so their hair still looks presentable. 
they get paid a fair price, and the women that work in factories, and um, they have a marketable skill now. So from the cutting of the hair, which can take up to three months training, they're trained on how to cut the hair properly so the cuticles are all facing the right way, and they're trained on how to weft the hair, how to wash the hair, how to check it for knit, how to process the hair. So you now, we, like there's a whole group of women that, there, so, you now have a trade that they can market and sell on, mm -hmm. and women that can make money in other ways. And a lot of them, we found that they have been doing dangerous <coughs> things in the past that perhaps aren't as safe and aren't as kind of, you know. So, um, so for example, how much if if um, if a full head costs sixteen hundred, how much does the woman who sells that full head roughly get? It completely depends on what her hair's like. Um, how much grey she's got in her hair. Um, the problem we did have is though, some people would come... Is grey hair more expensive? No, no, <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> 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 grey hair sort of moves. You know, £100 to someone in a rural Cambodia is deemed a fair price. It might not be to us, but that £100 will really go a long way. Is there any kind of fair trade movement around natural yeah. hair? Is, yeah, that, is that, that what you're trying to specifically... Well, yeah, specifically? I, I run a business, it's called Alyssum Hair. I don't know if we're the only ethical... Um, virgin hair company, I think we're the only ones okay. that kind of market right. ourselves ethical, but I'm not sure there might be others out there. But, okay. You know, there is definitely a, a movement, I think, starting. For okay. Them. Well, can I make a little point, sorry? Uh, okay, my yes. point is really different, yeah. but in the sense that when it comes to making money, for instance, right, um, as a black woman right now, I own my own business, I'm quite successful, and I'm doing that, and I should be proud of that. And I feel like people shouldn't come and attack people to try to make something out of themselves. A lot of people right now, usually with the hair, with the products, are sold by, no offense, European people. Yeah. Literally right now, this, this day for the past four or five years, black people can actually have their own businesses, sell their own hair, make their own money. Isn't that enough? And in fact, the most, you know, the first African-American millionaire was Madam C.J. Walker, and she made her money through hair products. So my thing to Diane, should there not be some sort of educational uh, program that teaches young black girls at a very young age to learn about their natural hair, how to... Uh, look after it well and how to get the best out of it and to love it because black hair is unique and can do okay. so many things that other hair styles can't do. Well, yeah. just to say, I think you've got lovely hair and a lovely hairstyle. Um, the thing, you're quite right. I mean, actually, most parents, most, try and encourage their young girls not to chemically straighten their hair young and, and try and encourage them to look after it. But I think once they get old enough to have their own way, they want to look like Naomi Campbell. But what people should show them, actually, not a mega education programme, but those pictures of Naomi Campbell where her weave is blown away and you can see she's bald, bald, bald. That is what years of weaves will do to your hair. You know, and I must say, as a senior hairstylist, <laughs> I have a lot of opinions about hair. Mm. And one of my first features, and I think, I'm not sure which black hair magazine it was, was on when I did a natural hairstyle similar to yours, and I was featured in the magazine. So it wasn't necessarily the weave that got me featured, it was the fact that I did beautiful hair. So to answer your question, you shouldn't just, like, a magazine saying black hair doesn't mean Afro hair. So does that mean, as a black woman now, I can't read the magazine? That's the case with everybody's style. You know, yeah. They should, I think it's only feature, the, the no, face feature shouldn't only... I think it was more that the, the lack of... Yeah. No, they do have some of the being is like right now, anything you're looking for, there's YouTube, there's magazine. If I want natural hair, I can find natural hair. If I want weave, I can find a weave. Anything you... Magazine. Once again, the main magazine has a weave and natural hair. I work in magazines a lot and I see that. They don't only just do Afro hair, only just European hair. They do every hairstyle. Okay, so no, I think we we'll just move on, as we don't have anyone from... Uh, do we have anyone here from yes, the... we do. Afro, any Afro hair magazines? No? Yeah, Anybody? she's there. I can see her. Yeah, she's there. <laughs> don't hide. <laughs> or Hello. Sad, I think, but yes. <laughs> now, I know you're not representative of the entire Afro magazine. hair publishing industry, but it would be really interesting to hear some of your thoughts on working for magazines. Can you just tell us what magazine do you work for? Um, I work for Pride magazine. For Pride, great. So um, just tell us uh, some of the challenges and frustrations of working for a black women's magazine with regards to hair. Um, I think the biggest frustration definitely comes down to um, revenue. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, natural hair, you know, it's not a, it's, it's not a huge money-making revenue. What makes money? weaves what makes money relaxes and that's and it's trying to find that balance obviously um in terms of obviously we want to cater to every sort 
every hair type. So, you know, I've got pages um, pages in a magazine that cater just for natural hair. I've got pages in a magazine that that cater for chemi chemically processed hair. Um, and obviously, in, in terms of edit editorial content, you have to find that balance in terms of, obviously, with your sort of advertising revenue, then it, and that's probably the biggest frustration. It's also a frustration for us, because we would love to see a greater representation of natural hair in, in, the, ma in the magazine. So is what you're saying that um, the makers of weaves and straight hair products buy advertising? And that's what funds the magazine. Yeah. Um, have you seen a change in the demand for articles on natural hair in the last 100%, few years? Hundred percent. You know, we, obviously we have a lot of people, um, you know, writing in saying they 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 want to, um, us to talk more about sort of natural hair, and we do try to. And also, you know, we've noticed that there's a big change in terms of the products that are now available. So, you know, there's this big um, sort of. Uh, rise for you know, Brazilian blow dries, for example, which obviously still allows you to have some sort of curls at the end of it. You know, a lot of um, companies are sort of producing products that um, cater for that. You know, a lot of the mainstream companies now are, are producing products that cater for natural hair. So you've got sort of care care, natural textures, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, things are, things are definitely changing. But, um, you know, those are sort of the biggest frustrations for us probably is it comes down to revenue. Thanks very much. OK, there was a question. There was another question over here. On the, over the weekend, I was at an event, and one of the clients said to me, I am an actu actress, and I do not get castings if I have my Afro hair, and she's mixed race. Um, but if I have a straight weave, I will get jobs. So it is political. It goes down to people not getting jobs because they have their hair natural. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily having the natural hair. I think it's the hairstyle that you do. Mm. Um, it's not the texture, it's the style that you do. If you work as a corporate lawyer and you're working um, in a, a firm, for, for example, Clifford Chance, you can't go into the office. <laughs> there are other law firms, obviously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are so many others. Um, you, not you can't, but it's not advisable to go in with a massive blowout afro. Why not? Why not? It's not. I, I so long say, as it's, I, I tell young women, so long as it's neat... I would and say fix just with a corporate star. I would it's say fine. just for me because I work. I also work in business. Can we just stop? Pause for one second. Hold that yeah. thought. Out of interest, show of hands. Who, if they were starting at a corporate law firm, would be comfortable showing up with an afro? And who would not? Okay, interesting. I guess I can sort of turn it into a question. Will it ever become a point where it no longer becomes political? Where afro hair? is acceptable where you don't have to think about going into the office with a big afro where you don't have to think about um your hairstyle in accordance to the industry that you're working can i answer that so, yes. yes okay yeah i think i think increasingly it will become less of an issue i think it's an issue of visibility um even now i'm sure all of us when we're out and about notice that there are so many more people with their natural hair. So it's just becoming more commonplace. And I think as that continues to happen, which I really think it will, the numbers are growing. I'm sorry, I don't think anyone's going to be relaxing hair or wearing weave in, I don't know, kind of 20 to 50 years. We'll look back on it as, you know, when we talk about Victorians putting lead on their faces and we're like, what were they doing? That's how we'll look at relaxer. I think. Maybe not weave, but relax I, here. I, I'm a member of Parliament, and I don't recruit for law firms. I have to go and talk to senior lawyers and senior people in business, both here in America. And I really don't accept that you can't walk into Parliament and you can't walk into Clifford Chance with natural hair. No, you can't wear a big, blousy afro, which looks like you could, you know, have birds nesting in it. But, <laughs> like but, but you can't wear that anyway. And also, I, and on that point, this idea that weaves are easy to manage than Afros is completely untrue. I remember interviewing a very nice girl who now actually worked permanently in Parliament because I gave her an internship. I interviewed for a job, but I couldn't get my mind around the fact she had this weave, it's probably her first weave, and it was all matted on one side. And I, thought to myself, <laughs> I thought to myself, mercy, mercy me, if you can't come out your weave, I'm going to come and work for Member Parliament. But in fact, I took pity on her, made her intern. She now has a, a good job, but her weave looks a bit better. But this is, kind of, I'm here to say you can work in a corporate environment, you can work in Parliament, and you can have natural hair. Don't let anybody tell you anything different. Okay. See, I believe it was a time and place for everything. In the same way, a European person can't go into an interview with really greasy hair that wasn't washed or whatever it is. So the same way, I can't go into an interview with like, my boobs out or certain kind of red lips or something. So if you have natural hair, like your natural hair is gorgeous, it's very tamed and pretty. It, you put time into your hair. Why does it have to be tamed? No, no, no. No, 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 no
no, no, let me no, no, finish. Let me finish what I'm trying to say. Let it go. Let me what I'm trying to say right now. So basically, it looks like you put time into your hair. I put time into this. It's not tame. It's not tame. Your hair is pretty. It's tame, honey. It's not frizzy. My hair is not frizzy. Okay, thank you, thank you. So it's tame. That's my point. So Edie, just pause for a moment. So Edie. Do you, so Emma started out talking very much about the language, actually. Yeah. Even, do you think words like tamed are perhaps assuming no, that, no. That, that there's a negative no, no, connotation no, no. As to that? As a hairstylist, I put time into things. A blower, if you come out of your house and you do not comb your hair, in Nigeria we call it like dada, where it's like little rice and whatever. It's like you haven't brushed your hair, that's unkempt. If you brush out your afro and it looks pretty, it looks tame, you put your time Who into it. Who decides what's a pretty, pretty by no, no, European no, no, standards? My, my theory is about putting time into it. Taking time yeah, but let, let, me, let me no, say something not, to you. you a it is, it is no. less the white people. No, 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 it is less white people in politics. It is more black people who are judgmental about Afro hair. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I do not see white people. They <laughs> hardly notice. You know, I walked into an office with an Afro. I walked into an office the next day with a weave, and they say, "Your hair's grown." <laughs> they don't really know. We're the ones. We're the ones that are standing in judgment. Exactly. You remember that sweet little girl who won a gymnastics team in the Olympics? Yeah. And all yeah. these black people are blocking and saying, "Look at the state of her hair." Well, even no, you were saying I am Blue Ivy when her so like no, tiny, tiny, tiny daughter, people that. were saying sort the edges. We say that, and we need to get out of that mindset. Okay, we, we just right. thank you. I know, I know, I know. As a beauty point of view, I'm looking into beauty. I look into about taking the time into uh, to your appearance. Afro hair for me is beautiful. I don't like not combed Afro hair. I'm sorry, I don't this like it. This isn't combed. I never comb my hair. You twisted it. You twisted yeah, it. Twisted That's it. an effort. Comb it. That's an effort. So if you need to wake up in the morning and left your house, I'm sorry, a European person that left their house, you know, wash hair for a month or two, will be greasy to me, and I wouldn't like that. I'm but sorry. But European people always have the tossle, just got out no, of bed no, look. No, yes, no, yes. no, no, no. Yeah, they no, do. No, yeah, they no, do. No, and we try no, and copy no, that. Every day. You know, you not see the weak people, try, people every try and have that tossle. Yeah, 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 for the a sake willing. of argument, we'll say European person who is willing to talk about their <laughs> hair routine. <laughs> hair for a month. I think I would like to go to your point about politics and culture of hair. Uh, there was, um, uh, um, I think they were asking people, I was asking women whether they are wearing extensions or wigs or whatever, and 95% of these people in this survey of these women, uh, they concealed that they were wearing any kind of hair extensions with whatsoever. I firmly believe there were not black women there because you are not afraid to talk about your weaves and your, you know, your, your wigs and you, all the, the things that you do. So this is, I, I love this. I'm in the wig business. I'm second generation wig makers. My mother started this 50 years ago. Uh, we have mostly European women coming to our shop. Uh, now we have more and more African ladies coming to our shop and really love it because they love their hair. Whether this is natural, uh, or oh, this is uh, weaves. Uh, we really love the attitude to their hair. Hey, I grew up hating my hair. Like I really had to like condition myself, de kind of like re-educate myself to be able to to love my hair. And I don't think that I'm kind of. I don't think that's an isolated experience. Mm -hmm. I like. Is, is, is oh, there a sorry. difference, for example, between a black woman wearing a weave and a white woman wearing extensions or a weave? Um, I think it's just kind of um, cultural how normal it is culturally, because I think there's a longer tradition of black women wearing kind of weaves and wigs and it being, and it being, it being, oh, being, it being more obvious that that's what they're doing. I, I mean, think they're white, changing how their hair looks more radically. Yeah, whereas white, white women are now, like I go into pack in like Dalston and there's like so many like white women in there and there, you wouldn't have found white women in like a black hair shop five or ten years ago, and now it's there's, there's lots of them in there. So they've really learned a lot from black hair. hair. Yeah. Yeah. To be not. historically accurate, white women have worn wigs since the 16th yeah. century, at, at, at the very but least. It's a shame yeah. people deny that they're really? wearing. That Elizabeth they're wearing. the first had thought, so I don't think she's denied it. But my point was just to say that there is good news on the popular culture front. Lupita. Younger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who has this lovely short afro, and everyone's saying she's the it girl. So maybe at last, you know, people are going to not think you have to have long Beyonce type weave to get on in the media. I don't have a problem with anyone wearing their hair however they want, as long as they know why they wear it that way, and they know they're doing it for themselves and not to look like what they think beauty has to be. It's a lack of diversity of what we're seeing. And I wanted to ask Diane if you really do think that. 
that there, you know, that there are that women can walk into a law firm with an afro. Because I've never been in any. I think creative environments, definitely. But in corporate environments, <laughs> you know, I've worked in publishing. I've been into law firms. I have family in those areas. I've never gone in and seen anyone whose hair, if it's natural, then it's plaited in, and it's very repressive. I I know women with natural hair who work in corporate environments, so obviously we've been to different corporate environments. When I say it has to look neat, it's like your clothes have to look neat. Even white men, they have to look neat. It's just an, it's just an overall appropriateness. But I don't accept that you can't work in Parliament, you can't work in a corporate environment with your natural hair. I just don't accept it because it's not true. And can I just okay, say so really... Okay. Um, but when I was growing up, like, having my hair done always felt like an effort. Um, and I would, like... I recently wrote a blog post similar to this actually talking about the fact that when you'd watch TV and you'd watch a white mother combing her, her child's hair it would be you know all very loving and it's all very simple <laughs> but yet your mother is getting ready to do gymnastics because she has to clean your hair and it's that kind of language that I think is probably holding us back because we kind of put that emphasis on everybody else on the flip side of that if you want to wear a weave feel free because no one knows what you're doing with your hair underneath I wear weave no problem because I know for a fact when I don't want to comb my hair I don't want to comb my hair it's simple as that. So I think we as black people need to probably put more emphasis on what we're, what we're passing on and how we put ourselves out into, into society. People accept us regardless. That's how it is, I think. Sorry, the first question is more of a point. It was the point about um, wigs. Um, my sort of understanding of wigs is that you said that um, white women have been wearing, or European women have been wearing um, wigs since the 16th century. False 14th century, false hair. Um, but those wigs reflect what their natural hair looks like. Um, when black women wear wigs, it's not Afro hair wigs that are going on top. It's hair that looks yes, very European. Not necessarily. Yes, very not in this room it is. It, I mean, it, it, everyone wearing, wearing a wig has had your opinion. Let me get it out. Let me get it out. Let me get it out, and then you can come back, yeah? Um, again, if I'm wrong, yeah, feel free to step in. But the point I'm trying to say is that, in, at least in my experience, when I look around, whether it's Dawson, whether it's Harden, whatever, and I see those wigs, the hair looks straight in comparison to all of the hair that I can see around here that is natural, that's kinky and curly and, you know, that sort of texture. Th that's I, not kinky or curly. You know, yeah. not, so you're yeah. saying the majority of women that you, the majority. The majority, yeah, the majority. And, and, and I'm using words, I'm talking generally because we're talking about the politics of the thing. Of course, there's always going to be um, um, exceptions to the rule. Everyone's going to jump on my back here, as I say it, but <laughs> my feeling about weave is just, I can't help but feel that you'll probably get a job on my head as well because you gave a good example of just, you know, when your hair's, you don't want to comb it, you, you put a wig on. Um, but um, I can't help but feel that when black women are wearing weave, it's almost as if they're hiding something, you know? Don't get me started. Don't get me started. Let me go. Let me go. Let me finish. Let me finish. It, it just, I can't help but feel... Okay. Okay. Edie, would you like to I can't help but feel that, that black women are hiding something. And, and the fact of the matter is, you know, your hair is your hair. And, you know, this whole argument about, oh, effort and time, I don't quite buy that. It's not true. You know, I don't know buy that. Okay, let Edie respond. We're, we're all very different across, across those racial lines. We're all very different the way we are. If it might take a bit more, inverted commas, effort for our hair to be done, well, that's just the way it is. Okay, so the, uh, do you as, like as the, the way you look? Point, oh, yeah, the way I look. Okay, honest, honest when you truth. Have, when you have your hair honest, in its natural form. Honest truth, without hair, without makeup, without a good bra, without a good control thing, I don't look good. No, 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 I don't look good. I really don't. Yeah, just, so just you say that, makes so it's all together. Wait, why do you understand that part? You don't understand about the hair. You're saying everything. I'm saying one component. All together. Without so, makeup, I wouldn't feel as hot. Without okay, heels, I wouldn't so feel as Emma, tall and pretty. How That's does that me. make you feel when you hear that a black woman without makeup, without weave, doesn't feel good about herself? No, no, I just say I don't feel oh. good about myself. Oh, what do you I say? I feel as you, pretty. I'm really pretty. You say, you, you, say you don't look good. I just don't feel as pretty. Ash. But you did actually say you, you don't look you said you, you said without makeup, you don't look good. No, you said you don't look good. No, no, I don't look as pretty. Okay, I can. That really resonates with me because I was completely there, and it is all part of a package. Like I think usually when I can't speak for you, but I can speak from my experience, and you can generalize from that if you want to. I didn't like the way I looked because every message communicated to me that the way I looked was inadequate. I didn't have the right features, so I hid. My features, I disguised my features under a weave. I also wore blue contact lenses. I wore packs of makeup. I, the, whole, the whole shebang. 
And if you'd asked me this question 10 or 15 years ago, I would have had exactly the same answer. But I need this. I don't look good without it. I look great with it, but without it. Da, da, da. So it was a real process of self-discovery and ultimately kind of self-love. And it was really difficult. I really had to kind of like reprogram myself. Um, but I can, I can completely relate and to that. But I, I, which is great, right? Once again, me being very biased, right? This is what I do for a living. Mm -hmm. I pay my bills with what I do for a living, which is hair and makeup. If I didn't like hair and makeup, I wouldn't be doing it. I love, I have a business degree, but I love hair and makeup. So if you're telling me, oh no, don't wear makeup, I have contacts in, I have makeup on, because it's what I do and I love to do. It doesn't make me a bad person, it doesn't make me, like I hate myself anymore There's no less. There's no question that makes you a bad person. No, I, 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 I and that. I think Emma I'm didn't start out very, you know, no, 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 it's not about him. Mm -hmm. His point of view is like, okay, if I don't feel pretty without hair and makeup, that's just my personal take. But I'm at home, literally Monday to Friday, I'm at work, I am very natural. When I come out here, I do all, I don't do this every day, this is like two hours work, I don't do this every day, no, I don't. I don't have energy for that. But once Di again, it's my <laughs> Diane. I just wanted to respond quickly to, to the guy over there. I always think there's a tiny, tiny touch of hypocrisy about black men and the subject of false hair. And I had, a, I, had a, I remember a woman that worked in my office. And, you know, sometimes she'd wear her hair in an afro or a short curly weave. Sometimes she'd have long straight hair. And she would say to me, that when she went to parties with the long straight weave, the men that didn't pen, no mind, when she had a natural hair, would give her the old one, two, one, two. So I was a tiny bit of hypocrisy. And just to come back to my thing about this thing about, yes, of course, you can wear your natural hair in a corporate environment. The current mayor of New York is called Bill de Blasio. He's a white guy, but he's married to a black woman. She's Trinidadian, in fact. And she has both. And her, her, her daughter has an afro hairstyle, short afro, but her son has this huge afro. And he filmed a part of political for his father. And once he'd filmed that part of political, the father's ratings shot up and he's now mayor of New York. And there was even a thing on Twitter, go with the fro. <laughs> so, so, you know, an afro actually is, doesn't debar you from the, the top of politics. I think that's quite, a, that, I think that is a recent development. Yeah. I think afro is very zeitgeist and that's great. Like, let's, let's harness that and just kind of keep pushing, pushing the afro message. Um, and also just the idea that um, people are like, when you have an afro, you're debarred from a situation. There's this idea that when you have an afro, that there's no versatility or no yeah. flexibility. My hair could be straight and look like it was relaxed tomorrow. All I need to do is have it set. And anybody with afro hair can achieve that. That's not because I'm mixed dress. As I said, my hair is very kinky. But you, afro hair is so versatile. Like, it's so much more versatile than relaxed hair. We can achieve any look with afro hair. So, okay, another question. I just want to say that in my, my part-time job, I, I blog about hair. And I'm interested, and I'm already going into schools, and my particular objective is to teach young girls about how to wear their wigs and their weaves without damaging their hair. Because whether you like it or not, young girls want to look like Kim Kardashian. They want to look like Naomi Campbell. We're not going to be able to stop them by saying, oh, it's going to damage your hair. What I'm trying to do is show them how they can have the best of both worlds in as much as they can have their natural hair, look after your natural hair, enjoy your wigs, enjoy your weaves without doing any damage. And my book's coming out this summer, by the way. <laughs> okay. Um, so first of all, I wanted to st make a statement to the gentleman on weaves looking good and things. And me and my friend were talking about this not long ago. When we go out, we notice that black men don't look at us now in natural. But when we had relaxed hair and weave, they were all over mm -hmm. us. Because, of course, we were light-skinned, which really used to offend me. And now the thing is, they're the ones that are making videos, standing up against us, saying, oh, but she's got a weave, so white's better because you can put your hand through her hair. But then when she's natural, they're like, oh, she'll have attitude, she'll be like this, she'll be like that. And then they walk away from you. But white men will come up and approach you and sometimes get a bit petty. <laughs> it's like, it's crazy. I have been on the tube and I've been in Canary Wharf with my client. I wear full blown afro. My, I have a client that's Shell. I work for um, a media advertising agency and Shell are completely responsive. I went to the, um, an appointment in Amsterdam and there was people from Silicon Valley. There was big venture capitalists and nobody said two words about my afro. But then when you walk around London, I'm Scottish, I expected people to be so much more responsive. I have people asking me, where do you get that from? Why is your skin like that? Your hair is like that? People won't even come up, like, talk to me. And they'll just start petting my hair. I'll be in a shop, I'll feel someone tugging on my head, I'll turn around, and they'll be like, oh, it's interesting, isn't it? And I'm like, 
you would ask to pet someone's dog, yet you think it's okay to come up and just touch my hair. And a lot of the women come up to me and like, could you please help me? Could you give me advice? Can you tell me how to deal with my daughter's hair? Like, because I'm finding it really hard to cope. And they don't feel like they can go up to a lot of black women or go into certain salons because they feel like they won't let them in to talk to them. And they're scared. So I've heard stuff of being overcharged or snide right. comments or talking down to them. Right. And I think this is the thing. It's not just about us as being, being the mixed race people and being the black people. We also need to talk to the mums of these children and help educate them and tackle those I think those mums need to go on YouTube. Yeah, well, like, it's not that hard. See, um, I know we have, I think we have some bloggers in the room. I'm going to call on you <laughs> in a second to just talk a bit, bit about social media and blogging and hair. But first, we have a question here. And then if the mic could go here so we're ready, that'd be great. Yeah, so my point was really about, I've got a niece as well who's mixed race, who's five, and again, has unfor unfortunately for her got the sort of thicker sort of side of the hair. And she looked in the mirror the well, other day. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm, just, I'm just saying this to kind of the, to prove a point. But, and she looked in the mirror the other day and she said, I That's hate That's the kind hair. of attitude that, I, that made me so messed up. Kind of <laughs> Let's get the point. point. Yeah. To, to illustrate my point. So she looked in the mirror the other day and she said, I hate myself, I, I hate my hair. Yeah. And that for me is heartbreaking for a five-year-old to be saying that. So I think this is an incredibly important dialogue to be having. B but I think we I kind of have to get to a point where we're having the dialogue beyond our community you know, with you know, sort of people beyond our community and really sort of understanding how we can educate our young girls and also their parents, you know, her mum is, is, is white as well, to kind of really understand black hair and understand how we can really kind of love ourselves from the inside out mm -hmm. because it's heartbreaking mm -hmm. for a five-year-old to be saying in this day and age, I hate, I hate my, my hair. thick hair. Okay, great, thank you. Um, would you like to say a few words? Introduce yourself and say a little bit about what you do. Um, hi, my name is Crystal. Um, I'm a blogger. Um, I use the name Crystal Afro on Twitter and Instagram and all that sort of stuff. I, so I found that through uh, getting to know my hair, that um, I, had to, I had to address a lot of the same things that Emma was discussing in terms of not feeling comfortable. I used to like love wearing weaves. I was totally in love with my weaves and my relaxed hair and stuff like that. Um, but then I started to confront a few things and realised that actually I loved my weave because, as the gentleman said, I was actually hiding something about myself. So I think uh, one of my points would be to the gentleman here, I think it's great to have like, some gentlemen in the audience um, because I do think the conversation needs to be had with both genders because mm. there's a lot of politics between, um, between the genders in terms of men and their cutting their hair and men not feeling comfortable growing their hair out as much as a lot of women don't feel comfortable growing their afro hair out. Um, and I don't think uh, that when a gentleman speaks, he should be particularly shouted down for the opinions. I think it's, whether we disagree or not, I think it's interesting to hear them. And that's the only way that we develop. Um, I also actually agree with you. I, I, I don't feel like it's right to promote a myth that afro hair is hard to manage no, because I know that that is the general idea, but actually I found by getting to know my own hair that it's not, hard to, it's not harder to manage than my hair was to manage when I had a weave. It's just knowledge, it's just understanding, it's just taking that time to really understand your own hair because once you understand it, it's actually the easiest thing in the world and you don't, it's much easier than trying to adjust it to be something it was never meant to be. So that's how I found it with my hair. Um, my question to Diane would be, I really love the things that you're saying, actually. I feel like you're being, you're being very supportive of uh, women and the whole natural hair thing, which is great. But why don't we see yours? Part of the thing is I have been in politics a long time. If you look at the pictures of me when I was first elected, it wasn't natural, but it was long braids. Like I say, my desire for change sometimes overcomes my political analysis of what hair signifies. But if you go home and you Google Diane Abbott, you will see my hair in all its very many varieties. I don't want to Google you, I don't want to Google you and see it from back then. I want to start seeing some more things <laughs> now. I want to see things that, I want to see you backing what you're saying. Oh, because no. I love what you're saying and I would love to see you backing it. No, 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 no. So the thing is, as I said, I'm kind of conflicted. I think there's a political analysis about hair and what it signifies. And I said right at the beginning, the further your hair is from what an actual black woman's hair would look like, the more I wonder about your world blue view. But, you know, I said right at the beginning, I've done everything with my hair and you will see me continue to do everything with my hair. And if you, unfortunately for me, because I am a politician, you don't have to judge my politics by my hair, you can actually judge my politics. Well, I do agree that actually what's underneath the weave or the afro is what's more important. I do actually, I completely mm -hmm. think that the person is more important than what's on top of the head. For black women in Britain, 
um, like 1950s to now, I found it a struggle to find uh, celebrated images of black women with Afro hair. And that's why I do what I do on the blog, um, on social media, and try and promote those images, because I feel like we need to leave something for the next generation to see when they look back to try and find us. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, we've got... I'm going to take a couple of questions together. So I'm going to take a couple of questions from this side, and then a couple of questions from this side. So if you could keep your questions as questions, and relatively short, please, so we can get as many people speaking as possible, that would be great. Yeah, um, so I guess my question is, because obviously, like, everyone's seen, like, you know, Malcolm X, when the, when the men have, when they're, Spike Lee and Denzel are there, with their, they're straightening their hair and stuff. So I guess my question is, politically, how did we diverge? Because obviously, you mentioned uh, Angela Davis, but then black men had, like, Huey Newton to look up to with the afro. But now, in this day and age, if a man was to chemically straighten their hair, and this isn't an attack, I think everyone's hair is wonderful, but if a man was to chemically <laughs> straighten their hair... Um, it would be, it'd seem a little bit archaic. I know a lot of us keep our hair short and stuff, but I just wondered politically what you guys think. Wh okay. Where did we diverge? Great, thank you. And another one from this side. Um, I'm going to go with somebody who's not asked a question. Okay, yes. I sometimes wear weave, I sometimes wear my natural hair. Um, and I think that the emphasis on having to do one or the other is also a lot of the problem. You can have choice, you can have a preference. And I think, you know, telling people that it's wrong or right to do either or is where okay. a lot of the problem is. So right. my question to, your, to the panel is, you know, do you think that the emphasis needs to be on either or, or can it you know, just be about choice. Okay. Basically, today we've spoken about weave and afros, but we haven't really spoken about dreadlocks, and I just want to know, do you still think that there's that horrible right. stigma of dreadlocks? Because I do get it sometimes, <laughs> since I've had dreadlocks, that people don't want to yeah. speak to me or Fantastic. get jobs and stuff. Okay, so whilst you think about those three, if the mic could just head over this way. So, um, so the question, who wants, if you can take a question each, um, the idea that Men did used to straighten their hair, but now it would be seen as rather old-fashioned and kind of even ridiculed, and yet for women, that's not the case. Um, does it have to be either or when it comes I'll to afro one. hair? Either or. Um, and then dreadlocks. Are dreadlocks ignored in this conversation? Are dreadlocks mainstream? I'll do the dreadlocks. Great. Well, just to say, the people that are most judgmental about dreadlocks are people from the West Indies. Um, people, people from the West, West Indies, Indies. yeah. Yeah, and Africans. Yeah, yeah. I love but I mean, they're, they're incredibly <laughs> judgmental about it. Yeah. Going, okay, we're hearing also Africans. Africans so, okay. Well, I'm so speaking so about the Caribbean, that's what I know. Okay. What I know is in the 60s, if you had rocked up to a smart cocktail party in Jamaica, all the 70s or 80s, if you'd rocked up to a smart cocktail party in Dreads, you know, the posh, what they call in Jamaica, upper St. Andrews crowd, would have looked at you askance. And again, it's that kind of self-hatred. It's what I'm saying. The people in... It's us. It's not them, it's us. I think dreads, actually, to use a word that someone criticised me for, look very neat and very smart. And some of my favourite hairstyles are women that can do dreads properly. It, it's a, properly? Oh, so, so, they, so they grow. Yes, properly. So they grow. Okay. Because so you have to do the dreads a certain way for them to grow. You, you, I'm, I've never had dreads. Just leave but, it. You can just leave it. Oh, well, that's... So we're going to come to this side of the room in a second. So we'll get some dreadlocks conversations on this side in a second. <laughs> Emma, either or... No need for either or. I always say that there is such an... I'm always amazed by how innovative and creative black hairstyling is. And weaves are part of that trajectory and tradition of just being able to do so much with our hair. So I am not against weave per se, but I am worried when somebody only feels comfortable when they wear weave. Like, I... At the moment, I can't imagine wearing a weave because I really just... I'm, I really love my own hair. But I wouldn't rule it out. I'd say I could, like, quite happily rock a weave in a couple of years. But I think that's, in that instance, it's fine, because I'm just as happy, if not more happy, to also have my natural hair. Okay. It's just when you only constantly wear the weave and feel kind of naked without it that I think there's a problem. Sorry, I personally like what you said. Like, you stood up and you spoke about yourself. I never heard you once say, well, weave is bad, weave is this. I like the fact that I think now we should either have natural hair people, dreads people, being good at what they do. So if you, want, if you care about dress, you go and find a dress person. If you care about natural hair, you, you can find okay. her and okay. learn about natural hair. Same thing as her, about weave right. as well. Thank but you. you shouldn't be either or. You should okay. literally, whatever you want, you can go and find them when you want to find them. Whatever okay. you love, you go for it. Great. Emma, um, do you want to say a few words about the idea that uh, men did used to straighten their hair, but yeah. now somehow are let off? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I'm really glad that you raised it. I think it's really interesting. I was watching um, a video with James, a, a little short documentary um, presented by James Baldwin, 
a couple of weeks ago, and it was filmed in, I think, the, late, the mid to late 60s. And he was just in a part of California talking to just kind of like men he just met on the street corner. And I was amazed that every single one of them had like really, really processed hair. Like all of them had like really relaxed hair. And I was just like, wow, that was just like completely commonplace and the standard hairstyle for men until quite recently. I don't know, I, I can't answer why it stopped, but the fact that it was so <laughs> widespread and that it has stopped, and we hardly even remember that it was the case, I think is really positive. And I see that as possibly being the future for women's hair as well. I think okay. the same process will happen. Thank you. So um, I promised this side three questions, and then we might have to wrap up, I'm afraid. So you've got three short, quick questions. OK, please. this is actually not a question. More and I'm going to take comments. Comments, you know, from people who haven't spoken so far. Um, it's more of a comment regarding um, people wearing Afro or natural hair in corporate environment. I work in the corporate environment. I've worked at Clifford Chance, Linklater's, and other banks as well. And I've worn my hair in Afro. I've now got it in locks. I've had it straightened. And it's always people being fascinated by the way my hair looks. Um, whether I go in neat or okay. neat, I right. just wake up and go, and everyone's fascinated by it. So I've not had any negative comment or anything. Does anybody on this side want to speak to, to the, the conversation contrary. about dreadlocks that was brought up? Yes, we have. My question is uh, just if you could wait for the mic. Why does it have to be neat? You say dread, dreads when it, when it looks neat. <coughs> I mean, I, I, I have a preference. It's, it's a personal preference. It doesn't matter if you have neat dreads or if you have unkept dreads. They're dreads and they look great. So yeah. why is there, why I, should I there think, be an issue? I think dreads look great. I think all sorts of things look great, but they're not necessarily what I would tell my daughter to wear if she was going for her first job into a Clifford Chance. I'm not saying she couldn't wear her natural hair. I'm not saying that, because I've said that consistently. But, yeah, I mean, but where, do you actually, her where do you actually... Change, that's telling her to change who she is. Oh, she no, wants she to have her hair. hair. She, she wants her to hair have like her hair dress. Oh, no. Um, now you're, you're coming to something quite different. I, if, if I had my way... I wouldn't necessarily go into Parliament the way I look every day, but I know that different working environments require a particular look. And you know the people who are most strict about wanting to see their politicians look corporate, wear a suit and all the rest of it? Working class people. Working class people do not appreciate you representing them if you don't look as they think the part. Now, the part can mean Afro hair, it can mean dreads, but, they're, they're, you know, in certain working environments, you're supposed to have a look. And I would never tell a young person, never tell a young person, you can go and, and interview. It's one thing if you're a senior, you've been doing it forever, forever in a day, but I would never tell a young person, you can go and interview and you can look unkempt and you can wear your body riders and so on and so on and so on. Because I feel I would be leading them astray. Sorry. Okay. So if you're interning for Diane, you know what not to wear. Exactly. <laughs> okay. And one more question from this side, please. Yes, with the mic. Thank you. But my question to the panel is, who is your hairstyle icon? <laughs> Can I be I don't have one. You don't have one? No. I use like all kinds of hair, everything, literally. Everyone. Emma, any hairstyle icons? I don't have one either, myself. Good answer. Diane? My, I, I think in the end, my hairstyle icon would be Angela Davis. But just a word here for somebody who some of you may not have heard of or may not even like, Condoleezza Rice. I disliked almost everything about Condoleezza Rice, particularly her politics. But what I loved about her, she could be on a plane for 10 hours <laughs> and come off that plane with her hair looking grey, which anybody who's either got relaxed her, we will know it's pretty hard. So Angela Davis, but, you know, shout out to Condoleezza Rice. <laughs> There's two people I would love to be elected <laughs> together. Okay, I think, just until we've got time for a couple more questions, so I'm going to do one from each side, from somebody who hasn't spoken already. Um, so I think you haven't spoken, and you had your hand up earlier. And then we're going to go for one at the back. Somebody else, okay. Yeah, so you've got the mic already, so you go first, and then you, please. Thank you. Even before we said, um, someone mentioned European women were wearing we, uh, wigs in the 1600s, but do people know that in ancient Egypt, it was black women who were making wigs for the kings and queens of Egypt. Um, do people know the origins of how braids came up and how they traveled around Africa, the stories behind that? 
and how our hair has evolved over not just a few thousand years. Our history goes way, way past that. So the question is, how do we get to know our history better so we can appreciate ourselves better? Um, I was just going to ask how influential you think the media is, because I was looking for some natural products the other day, and uh, I came across a, a popular brand who I don't know if I'm allowed to mention. <laughs> go on, go for it. Well, it it's uh, Mazzani by L'Oreal. Oh, yeah. And they describe on their products link, uh, our formulas care, care and nourish dry, rebellious, and coarse hair. <laughs> 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 and I was quite offended because my hair is, is none of those things. <laughs> I mean, it, it listens to, to what I'm saying. <laughs> and, I, and I like it the way it is. But, but uh, your, your point on language, I think, is really important because if this is the language that even the media is using, mm. then young girls are, are going to take this language and that's how they're going to mm -hmm. feel about themselves and their mm -hmm. hair. And how is so, that change? Diane, I'm going to ask you to ask, answer the question about history. How can we... Uh, make it so that we know more about our history and either of you to answer the question about media and language. Well, I think there's a general proposition about how do we educate young black people about their history as black people so they're not getting their self-knowledge their, their self from the Sun newspaper or, you know, MTV or whatever it is. And I just think, you know, there are events. I mean, Hannah curates some wonderful events in the South Bank where you will learn more about black history and culture. There are exhibitions very regularly in Cambridge, for God's sake. They had an exhibition about the Afrocom. So I just think, as parents... <laughs> <laughs> I just think that as parents and as part of the extended family, we just have to be very vigilant and very conscientious about taking the young people that we know to see these sorts of things and talking them through it. Okay, thank you. Emma, language and the media. Yeah. So I think the language thing is so important. And when I started really thinking about it, I just think it's so messed up. Like, there are no positive words that are actually used to standardly describe Afro hair. There just aren't any. All the words are really, really negative. So you just have this really like insidious message constantly being communicated to you anytime your hair is talked about that it's inadequate and inferior. And the media, without even thinking about it, use people just use those words without even thinking about it. And I think they're, 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 it's racist terminology. We just haven't acknowledged it as such now. Um, so I actually think we really need to try and come up with like a new vocabulary to describe our hair. But to do that, we can't be trying to describe our hair within a European kind of beauty regime because then our hair, our hair doesn't have those characteristics or those features. We need to kind of, yeah, think of a new vocabulary. So that, that's my challenge for us to go away with um, this evening and think about the words that we can use to describe the features of our hair. Because our hair is like so amazing. I'm just like, my hair is resplendent. Like all of your hair is resplendent. <laughs> if we're to compare European, if we're to describe European hair by our standards, what European hair is really like resplendent. Why do we need our hair to go down? Why do we need to tame it? Why can't it be wild? Why can't it be huge? Our hair is supposed to be like that. And I think it's kind of a manifestation of our power when our hair is like that. And I think that frightens people. Um, so we're gonna, I, we haven't got time for any more questions, I'm afraid. Uh, but if I could just ask the panel for closing thoughts, what message would you like the audience to go away with today? Edie. Um, basically, my thoughts are, you said about European hair. I have clients that have extensions in. European hair can be described as fine, greasy, thin. And it's got negative, it's, it's got exactly, negative words, exactly, but it exactly. also has but, loads of positive ones. We have no positive ones. But we all have positive hairs. We do. If you look for it, you find it. So everyone has uh, a different. I've, I've looked. I've looked. I mean, so when again, you get to your closing <laughs> point, so uh, Edie, if you could just okay, do your okay. closing so point. So once again, I'm a big believer in whatever you want to do it, do it well and do it best. Do your research. I do good hair and I do good makeup. I did my research and I've trained myself for so long. You do amazing natural hair and you make sure you train yourself in doing that. So whatever you want to learn, go out there and learn it. Do not blame anybody else for your issues. If you don't like yourself, work hard and be a better person for it and love yourself. I love myself. I just like beautiful hair and makeup. I like making money as well, to be honest. I know what it is. I like to make sure that I work hard and take care of myself and my family. So whatever it is, my point is, don't judge someone by the way they look. It's their personal choice. If you choose to have natural hair, that's your choice. If you choose to have weave, do not judge me for having a weave. Just love who you are, and that's what it is. Thank you. Emma, what message would you like the audience to take from today's conversation? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll follow up on that idea of choice, because I think it's really important. Of course, we all have the right to individual choice, but we have to be honest about what's informing those choices. So interrogate the choices you're making. 
Think about why you're making them. Don't act like the choices operate in isolation and that you're not massively influenced by all the messages that are communicated to us by the world around us. Um, so yeah, just think about your choices. Thank you. <laughs> Diane. Well, it's as I say, the personal is the political. Of course, everyone should be able to have a choice. And as I told you, I've exercised dozens of choice. And what happens under your hair is more important than the way your hair looks. Mm -hmm. But all of these things, in the end, have a political cultural significance. And just to, we will be stronger and more self-confident as a community and move forward faster the more we are generally comfortable with who we are. That's all I have to say. Great. Fabulous. OK, so I'm afraid we do have to wrap it up now, but um, a big thank you to you guys for some really great interactive questions and a huge thanks to the panel for a lively and passionate debate. Um, just to say, as part of this uh, Selfridges Beauty uh, Salon series, there's a series of films connected to each of these uh, conversations that have been happening. So everybody that's signed up today, um, they have your website, and we've made a. There is a film that's been made about specifically about natural hair. Um, so I think the guys here are going to make sure that gets to everybody.